So uh, let's continue with the third talk of the session uh, on untapped potential of encoding predicates by arithmetic circuits and the application by uh, Shuji uh, Kasumata. Right. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so my name is difficult to pronounce, so just please call me Shu if you see me offline. Uh, so uh, this title is, what I'm going to talk about is the, un the untapped potential of encoding predicates by arithmetic circuits and their applications. And it's a little bit ambiguous, so first of all, I, I'll try to explain what I did. And there's two primitives that we focused on. And this is not important what they are right now, this is just the primitives that I want to explain, that I worked on. And the first one is the pairing-based verifiable random functions. And again, it's not important what this is right now, but the current situation of creating this is that there's a, a lot of uh, constructions of this, but we either require a strong security requirement or require a long verification key and or proof size. And the other primitive that we focus on is the lattice based predicate encryption scheme supporting the so called multi dimensional equality predicates. And it's not important what this is, but it's just that uh, we require a strong security assumption or an exponential decryption time to construct these primitives in the current manner. So, without further explaining what these are, I guess a natural question would be can we do better? And this is our main question. And these two primitives may seem completely independent, and actually they are. However, uh, both of these constructions, implicitly or explicitly, depends on this particular predicate during construction. So this is our key insight into these two primitives. And that being said, the sum summary of our result is that we detach these predicates with the cryptographic primitives and provide an efficient encoding of predicates into shallow arithmetic circuits. And to be more concrete, so our result is that we propose two encoding schemes for this particular predicate called subset predicate. And basing this on subset predicates, uh, we construct, well, nice uh, pairing-based VRFs and lattice-based predicate encryption scheme for the multidimensional equality predicates. And one thing to note is that uh, this talk is not about circuit lower bounds. So it may seem like that, but uh, the thing is, the encoding that we provide as the arithmetic circuit, it has to be compatible with the underlying algebraic structure. So we don't get this for free. So that's why we require two encoding schemes for the subset predicates, one for the VRF and one for the lattice space predicate encryption scheme. Okay, so that being said, uh, the overview of this talk is going to mainly focus on the VRF construction. So, this will highly deviate from the presentation took in the paper, and all the arguments are super simplified for me to better convey the intuition. So, first of all, what are VRFs? VRFs are short for verifiable random function, and uh, this was introduced by Mikali Rabbit and Vadhan in 99 at Fox. And this is essentially a PRF that also allows you to prove that you computed the output value y in a correct manner. So what it is, is that when somebody says, I output, out, I output this value y using this uh, input x, it also allows you to attest this fact by producing this proof pi. So this is the evaluation algorithm, so on input x, it's going to output y and a proof pi. And using this verification key output by this generation algorithm, anybody can publicly check that this uh, proof is correct. So they can be sure that this output value y was computed using x. And this has uh, these following types of applications. And the syntax of VRF is very simple. It's basically a PRF, and the only difference is that it has this verification key and the proof pi, and there's this new verify algorithm. And we have three requirements for VRFs, and one is the very obvious correctness, which states that uh, if you evaluate this uh, on this input x, then this should verify. And the second requirement is this uniqueness, and this is what makes VRFs really interesting and difficult to uh, construct. So uniqueness uh, tells you that you have to, uh, for all verification key and uh, input x, there can exist at most one pair of y and proof pi that this verify algorithm will output one. So this is a very strong uh, requirement in the sense that this verification key can be possibly malformed. So 
So it does not necessarily have to be generated by this algorithm. So this is why it makes this so difficult and why it can't be created from, from simply from PRFs and non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs because using a NISC proof, uh, you, could, uh, you have the zero, efficient zero-knowledge simulator, so you can always do this. And it, it kind of defeats the purpose of PRFs. And the uh, final requirement we have is this adaptive pseudo-randomness, which captures the notion of PRFs. So what this is, is that uh, the adversary can look at any input-output uh, of his choice. He creates the challenger, and at some point, he's gonna ask for an output which he has not known the input. Uh, he's gonna query the input to which he has not queried before, and when he receives this YB, he has to determine if it, it's a completely random element or an element output, outputted by this evaluation algorithm. And when this is very close to 1 over 2, we say this is adaptive pseudo-random. And finally, for preparation, the tools we will be using in this presentation is ordinary symmetric bilinear maps. And the hardness assumption we will be using is this L-decisional Diffie-Hellman assumption. So we're given this tuple here and decide that Z is in this format or a completely random element in this target group. And since this is a non-static assumption, we want L as small as possible because that will mean that it's a weaker assumption. So L being small is better. And the other crucial observation that we'll be using is that using this tuple, we can actually compute up to a degree L polynomial of this format. So when I say there's going to be a polynomial, uh, we want that polynomial to be as, as low degree as possible because that will allow us to use a very weak assumption. Okay, from now on, I want to talk about the <clears throat> previous works and how we construct VRFs in a very high-level manner. So there's essentially two lines of works on VRFs, and the first one is a generic construction based on general primitives. And this is a very nice approach in the sense that it provides us valuable intuitions on how strong VRFs are as a cryptographic primitive. So we currently know that it, we require general non-interactive witness and distinguishable <laughs> proofs and constrained PRFs to construct VRFs. However, uh, taking this approach, uh, since we don't know any uh, efficient constructions of these two primitives, uh, the VRFs that are constructed using these primitives are either high, are highly efficient and require strong assumptions. And the other approach took is the specialized constructions based on pairings. And for this approach, there are many, many uh, constructions that are either very efficient or based on weak assumptions. So this talk will be mainly focused on this line of work. And, uh, okay. So, as I said, there's a lot of uh, works along this line, and I want to explain how they construct this in a very, well, high-level way. And this is a template construction of VRFs, and most of the scheme follows this very general framework. So what they do is that for the generation algorithm, when it outputs a verification key and a secret key, it's just going to be a bunch of discrete log instances. And for evaluation on input x, what we're going to do is that we're going to compute this function f on input x and these secret keys. And this function f right now is it's going to be used as a black box. It's publicly known, but it's not important right now what this is. It's just that everybody knows this function f, and they're going to compute, well, the evaluator is going to compute it on this input x, and the input with secret keys. And the output is very simple. We're just going to put this in the exponent here. So this is the pseudo-random value y. And for the proof, what we're going to put in is that uh, this is a scheme-specific element that would help us to verify. And essentially, it's just going to be helper components of, of these kind of formats. And it will be clear if I explain this verification algorithm. So verify what we do is that we're going to compute the coefficient of this function f. And as, as I said, this function f is public, but we can't compute this, this function value because we don't know this uh, secret key. But what we can do is that we can view this, these as indeterminates and compute the function form of this function f on input x. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to compute the coefficient of this function f. And then, using the terms in this proof pi, we're going to iteratively check the validity of y. So what I mean is that if v1 is actually in this format, we can check this 
by taking these two verification keys, uh, GW1 and GW2, and take the pairing and see whether this D1 is in the correct format or not. And now if we know that this D1 is in the correct format, we can move on to checking whether D2 is in the correct format. And we kind of move up this ladder, and at the very end, we can check that this Y is going to be uh, correctly formatted in this format, because we know the polynomial form of this. So this is the general way to create uh, BRF schemes. And as I said, what do we use as this function f? And usually what people do, uh, use is this thing called a admissible hash function. And it is an information theoretic object. And, and in the essence, what it is, is that it's a key function that secretly partitions the input space. So what it does is that uh, this k key is, uh, no, is only known by the person who instantiated this admissible hash function. And on an input x, it's going to output 0 if and only if x is inside this partition, this gray area, where this gray area is created by this key k. And it's going to output 1 otherwise. And this is a very nice tool for the simulator to secretly embed secrets during simulation. So I won't get into details how this is defined, but all the BRF schemes so far actually relies on admissible hash functions. And this is a useful tool to prove adaptive security in other settings such as IBEs or signature schemes. And finally, before getting into the detail, uh, I want to talk about what is a good trait of a BRF scheme. So there's basically two measures of a good trait. And one is that we require a size, uh, we require verification keys and proofs to be small as possible because they influence the communication costs. And the other measure is that, well, obviously, if we want to prove that this VRF scheme is secure, we want it to prove it under the most weakest assumption as possible. So these are the two traits of a, two traits of a good VRF. So uh, now I would explain our work. And this is a very non-exhaustive list, so there are a lot of other works on VRFs, but these, these uh, well, mainly three works are the state-of-the-art VRF so far. And the top two, from Jaeger, and Hoffheinz and Yegar from TCC. They were the first to con uh, construct VRS schemes with a weak hardness assumption. And when I say weak in this presentation, I roughly mean that these uh, uh, factors are poly uh, sublinear in the security parameter lambda. So this was the current situation. And, and this year in crypto, Yamada uh, presented a short verification key and a, and a proof size VRS scheme. However, they uh, required a stronger hardness assumption compared to Jaeger's and Hoffman's and Jaeger. So our work is that uh, we combine the two of these uh, worlds and uh, we acquire the first short verification key and or proof size while keeping the hardness assumption weak. So this is our result. And our high level approach is that we uh, start from the Yamada 17 scheme and try to weaken their assumption. And this is just our starting point. This is the high-level uh, approach that we took. So the actual construction is quite different. So the main observation of our work is that uh, even if a function f is defined uniquely, the best way of computing it may depend on the application. So an easy example is that let's say this function f is in this format. So this is known by everybody and it's defined uniquely. However, how to compute this may depend on the application. So obviously this can be uh, computed by adding 1 to n, or it could just be n times n plus n divided by 2. But depending on what kind of algebraic structure this cryptographic primitive has, maybe we can't divide it. So maybe this above one might be the best way to compute this function. So this is our, well, very general intuition of uh, this best way. So what we do is that we propose a better way to compute admissible hash functions for our work. And to explain that, I first want to uh, show this uh, very nice contribution of the Yamada 17 scheme. So in his uh, paper, he realized that computing the admissible hash function is actually equivalent to computing this uh, subset predicate. They're essentially equivalent. So computing this is the same as computing this in a very high level way. So what it means is that as this subset predicate is defined as this function. So this k was the secret key. So if k is inside x, it's going to equal 1, and otherwise it's going to output 0. 
And uh, if you remember that picture, this is the implicit partition made by the admissible hash function. So the question now uh, boils down to how do we compute this predicate, subset predicate in our VRF scheme? So the previous approach took by Yamada 17 is that uh, there's a lot of settings here, but this is not important. So uh, they were presented by the Boolean circuit representation. So to decide whether k is in x, to compute this, uh, what you first do is that if this holds, then that means that all of the elements in the set k will be included in x. So this is an and computation here. And to check whether this holds, this is the same as checking that either any element in x is equal to k i. So this is an or. So this is an and or computation. And finally, uh, since this is a Boolean circuit representation, we have to bit decompose these guys. So we, to check that k i is equal to x j, what we do is that we did bit decompose it and check that all the coordinates are equal to each other. So that's another and here. So uh, this in a Boolean circuit representation, this will be an AND OR AND circuit. And essentially, uh, written this in arithmetic fashion, this will be a highly multiplicative function, a polynomial. So, this is a high degree polynomial, and uh, if we want to instantiate the admissible hash function, this will be roughly lambda times log Q lambda, and where the lambda is a security parameter. And, uh, if you remember me, so when I said high degree polynomial, the degree is essentially the L in the LDDH assumption. So we require LDDH assumption where L is in this format. So L is more than linear, so this is a stronger assumption than what we want. So our idea is that uh, we can actually do a more efficient embedding by observing that there can exist at most one Ki such that Ki is going to equal xj. This is because if, let's say, ki equals to x1, then it can't equal to any other elements because all of these elements are distinct. So using this very simple observation, what we can do is that since uh, we can say that at most one clause is satisfied in this uh, Boolean representation, and all these is either one or zero, so this is actually equivalent to just adding these because they only take one or zero values and since only one of them is satisfying, this is equivalent, functionality uh, equivalent. So here we required a mul uh, multiplication because we had to do the OR computation. And, however, we could change that to addition. So what we gain is that we can change this multi multiplication into an addition. And by, well, choosing which part to make it into addition, we can actually make this the most heaviest term so we can actually lower the degree down to log cubed lambda by using this uh, simple observation. And now L is fully log, and well, moreover, it's sublinear, so it's a weaker assumption now, and this is the main idea of our work. However, there's a lot of technicality swept under the rug right now, and as I said, this paper is not about circuit lower bounds, so it may seem like it was about how to encode that predicate into the most shallowest circuit. However, as I said, all these encodings must be compatible with the algebraic, understru the algebraic structure that this VRF offers us. So that's why, uh, since the encoding is now different from Yamada's original scheme, the actual construction is uh, pretty different. And uh, furthermore, uh, taking this linear format here, <clears throat> taking advantage of that, we can actually further obtain a quadratic reduction in the verifi uh, verification key size. So this is our very high level idea of our VRF scheme. And before we end, uh, I want to explain a, a little bit of an extra of what we do for the predicate encryption scheme. So we can actually move that idea one step further in the sense that if we don't require to preserve functionality, we can further optimize the circuit embeddings. So as a quick recap, what we did in the previous uh, VRF scheme was that to check whether k is in x, we did this representation. And as you can see here, if k is in x, it's going to output 1, and if not, it's going to output 0. So this is, in a sense, preserving the functionality of this uh, Boolean value. However, the question is, do we really need to preserve the output value? And maybe, in some cases, we don't have to do this. 
So a more general way of viewing this is that if k is inside x, it's going to output an element in s0, and otherwise it's going to output an element in s1. And as long as s0 and s1 is disjoint, then this is actually constructing a partition in some sense. So that now the range does not need to be in 0, 1. So uh, using this ob observation, uh, what we can do is that if k is inside x, this is an if and only if statement, so if, if k is inside x, then that means that all the ki's must be in x2. So all these must be satisfied. So let's say the L, uh, set number of k is, the cardinality is eta right now. Then this is equivalent to saying that the summation of this is equal to eta. And using the previous uh, in encoding scheme, the functionally preserving encoding scheme, we can actually convert this into summation again. So this is equivalent to computing this guy. So now what we get is that we can actually lower this product down to a summation now. So it's not 0, 1 anymore, but this is going to equal eta if k is inside x and not in eta otherwise. So in fact, we can actually lower this down into a summation again using other techniques. So this will be a linear function in the end. And using this linear function, we construct our lattice space predicate encryption scheme for the multidimensional equality predicates. And as a conclusion, I guess the main takeaway of my presentation was that uh, the idea is that a lot of cryptographic scheme embeds the predicate in a very uh, implicit manner. So by detaching the predicates from those cryptographic schemes and embedding these predicates into shallow arithmetic circuits and bringing that, that back to the uh, cryptographic primitive, sometimes we can get a very you know, efficiency gain in the actual construction. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, we have time for questions. Okay, so there's no questions, so let's thank the speaker again.